Mm -hmm. Ah, actually, there was a button saying go live. I found it. Now we should be live. <laughs> Let's check. Oh my God, uh, that's embarrassing. Okay, so we're live. Is that good? Yeah, I can see it myself. Very cool. There's a 20 seconds delay, by the way. Okay, I'm going to post it now on uh, on um, Discord. Okay, perfect. Uh, And now I'm going to join the community call also, right? <clears throat> so now let's see. Um, okay, one, two, one, two. So um, I'm on the community call on Discord. Can you please on Discord confirm that you can hear me, please? And Francesco, if you can join on Discord also, that would be wonderful. Um, and that way people can hear you on Discord. And people can also um, uh, get, and people can also uh, hear you on, uh, see you on uh, YouTube. Okay. All right, so, for everyone, welcome to our community call. I've managed to make YouTube Live work, which is great. We <laughs> So you can follow today's community call on Discord and on YouTube Live. And yeah, so you get sound on Discord and you can get sound and vision on YouTube. So I think with everything we're all set so let's go um thank you for joining me today uh, francesco can you uh, are you connected uh, is your voice connected on discord uh i'm i request to speak on discord you need to ah, i can yeah. see the little end risen now invite to speak you should be able to come up on stage awesome okay. so you'll see there's a small echo the setup is not uh, perfect but that's what we have, and it works for now. Uh, can people on Discord hear me? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, on people on Discord, can you all, can you hear um, Francisco? Can you please tell us in the community call channel, please? Oh, yeah, probably I should also try to speak and say something. Uh, can you sing a song? Uh, no, probably. No? See if, if I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mm. Okay, so they can't hear you, apparently. So um, can you try uh, to check your um, your Discord um, configuration, please? Okay, just have a strong echo. There is a strong echo. It's okay. uh, not enjoyable. But you should be able to, um, to switch off just your... Uh, you should be able to switch off uh, one of these. Okay, let me try. Uh, so now they, they can't hear me, right? I, I I can't tell you I'm uh, with you on Zoom, so. Oh. Okay. okay, so BZH Buck is saying that he can hear you. He okay, so now you. everything is working and I think I fixed the hackle. Wonderful. Okay, so, okay, nice. okay wonderful. All right, so let's start. Um, thank you all for uh, attending our 10th community call. 10 is a nice number. I don't know if we should celebrate these or power of twos or you know, what would be the equivalent, you know, because uh, C traditional computer CPUs are base two. I don't know what's the base we should use for Cairo because we're not based on, you know, it's up to a certain felt. So should we celebrate prime numbers for community calls or something like that? I don't know. Anyway, welcome for our 10th community show. Uh, community show, no, uh, community call. Today, uh, we have Francesco uh, Chicon with us, who is going to talk to us about building React, uh, React apps on uh, StarkNet. Um, and then we'll have uh, a short discussion AMA about the roadmap for StarkNet and what's coming in uh, version 0 0.8, which was released this week. Um, all right, Francesco, uh, welcome. Uh, can you introduce yourself in, in a few uh, minutes, please? 
Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm Francesco Cetron. Uh, I'm like a StartNet developer, I guess. And at VSG now I'm focusing on everything from smart contracts. So I'm working on modular contracts. So and now to VSG, make it easier to develop contracts. Uh, but also, you know, I'm working on front end uh, libraries, for example, the StartNet Preact. So I'm really full stack StartNet developer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, let me start. I share my screen. Perfect. You should be able to. Yeah. Ooh. Desktop. Okay. Okay, perfect. So today I'm going to talk about the StartNet React library that I wrote. And it is that it is make it easy to use StartNet from a React application. So a little bit more about myself. So I'm Francesco, as I mentioned. Uh, you might know me for, for like Bisma Bots, which is a small 2D block building game on StartNet and it's live. And also now I'm working full-time on Atlantis, where I'm a founder. And the idea is that we want to build a no-code platform for people to deploy their own NFT marketplace, right? And so if you want to work together, we are hiring across the board. So we are hiring front-end developers, uh, StartNet developers, and also, you know, if you're a functional programmer, you would like to work on our backend. And if you want to follow for news and things about StartNet, you can find my Twitter account there. Uh, you can get in touch with me at any time. And so also before we start presenting, I want to say a big thank you to the author of StartNet.js, because uh, why the library I wrote basically allows you to interact with StartNet from React very easily. Everything goes through StartNet.js first, right? So what they do is that they encode data so they can be sent to the StartNet blockchain. And also they get data from the StartNet gateway and test all of the coded data so that you know, the developers can use it very easily. So again, StartNet React will not be possible without StartNet.js and the work from the team. So thank you again. And so, okay, so if I had to describe StartNet React in one sentence, I would say it's a collection of hooks for StartNet, right? And basically, that's the way, okay? And so how do you get started with uh, StartNet React? Uh, I provide a nice template that uses Next.js to basically set up the project. And basically, you can, you know, with one command, you create a project, you can name your app with whatever name you want to use, and then it's ready to start developing. Uh, notice that if you instead want to use create React app, uh, there's a bug in StartNet.js, so it doesn't work with that. So I recommend to use Next.js for now until uh, we fix the bug. Uh, actually, we figure out why there's a bug there, then we fix it. Okay, so basically, the entire presentation is going to be about. Uh, this small thing here. So this hook, you start right? And I assume that the, the audience today is not super familiar with you know, React or React hooks and they want to learn more. And so you know, I, I will go a bit into the, the details and the basics because I think it's important. We can really guess that what this hook is doing is that it's, it keeps track of the state and somehow it provides functions to change state, right? So we can see that we somehow, we will see later how, we track what is the current and connected account, if any, right? And we also provide a function to connect the account. And we can see that now um, with the version of uh, StartNet VR that I released yesterday or the day before, we also have this injected connector, which is basically the web browser uh, wallet, which in this case on StartNet is Argentex. And so we are really future proof in that if there will be new wallets or new connectors, for example, wallet to connect, we can support them easily. So now what are hooks, right? I already mentioned them. I say, oh, StartNet React is a collection of hooks. But if you're not familiar to React, it doesn't mean anything, right? It could be actually be confusing. And so hooks are basically a way to reuse and compose stateful logic in your components. So before functional components and hooks, developers had to use uh, class components, but you know, the issue was that it was very difficult to, to compose them. So if I had some behavior, then I would write some code and then there was no easy way to share this behavior between different components. And so Hoots solved that issue. And the idea is that uh, on the left, I define a hook and on the right, I'm using, right? And usually by convention, uh, Hoots, start, I have a name that starts with Qs. And so in this case, the, we call this uh, hook as an example, we 
call it use counter. And you know, from the name we guess is this geodesic counter that can be incremented or decremented. And so we compose hooks together. And so we have our use state hook, which is a built-in provided by React to keep track of the counter value. And this hook basically returns a function that uh, returns two values. One is the current value of the counter, and one is a function to update the value of the counter. And the nice thing is that after I update the value of the counter, uh, React automatically updates the value of the counter, right? So this sort of is like reactive programming, and that's, that's where they get the name from. And then after that, we, we define two functions. One is used to increment the counter, and one is used to decrement the counter. And we can see that this set counter function, so the function that is used to update the value of the state, uh, basically uh, takes off, you know, we can invoke it, we, uh, we pass in a function that will take the previous value of the state and returns the new value of the state. So in this case, we have the counter and we update the counter and in decrement function, we decrement the counter. And the second argument to the functions is, you know, between square brackets is basically sort of what is called like the dependency list. And so every time, that the value inside the dependency list changes, the value is basically the, 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 the hook is reevaluated. And so, for example, in this case, we don't want to put the counter as a dependency of our increment and decrement function. Otherwise, React will enter in an infinite loop, and that's bad. And yeah, so then at the end, we, we set up everything for the, our hook and we return the value of the counter, and then the two functions one to increment and one to decrement the, the counter. And finally, we can use it there. Right? And so we can see we, we use it by calling use counter and basically uh, splicing the, the result to get the counter and the two functions. And we can show the, the value of the counter. And we also we have basically as a callback to the buttons on click event, we add these two functions. And what I found is very exciting is that we have to automatically update the, our component every time the value of the counter changes. And so we don't need to really think too much about it, sort of like the data flows through our program. And so that's the basic of hoops. And finally, right, before we can really start looking into the library, there's one more thing, is that we have this uh, idea of provider that if you develop a uh, React application, you probably encountered before. And they basically there are special type of components that are used to track global state. And so in this case, we will wrap our entire application in this StarkNet provider. So then all the children component will be able to sort of like track the StartNet global state, you know, without having to explicitly pass it down the, the component uh, IRT. So, okay, so what does basically StartNet React provide? It provides these six hoops that we are going to see in more detail. So I'm not going to go over them now. And so the first hook and the most important one, the one you will use every single time, is this use startnet hook. And all it does is it returns basically some values and it returns the currently connected account and a function to connect uh, an account, right? And this function takes our connector. And at the moment, the only type of supported connector is the web browser connector, so the injected connector, right? So when you call this function with a connector, you know, as in text, we ask the use to, to connect to the wallet and then they confirm and then the value of account will be updated. And so it will display the, the user account. And uh, here we can see how to use this hook. So again, at the top, we call the use startnet hook. Uh, we, we are interested in this in the account and the connect function. And then if you have, a, if the user connected their account, then we want to display that account to, to the user. Otherwise we can basically you know, show a button that when it's pressed, the user will use to connect to the to, you know, to connect to arts and types. And basically, you know, with a few lines of code, we have basically have the structure to be the, you know, that the, the button you usually find in top right corners of uh, dApps, right, where they show the, your account number. If you're not connected, they, they ask you to connect to, to arts and types. And then the second hook, which is used a lot, but not in the way that you would think, is that basically the, the hook that returns the current start map block. Uh, behind the scene, this, this uh, hook, basically keeps pulling the, the startnet gateway to see which is the what block is the current block right and i think uh, it can be like the, the interval at which the block is fast can be configured i think now is around three to five seconds and the idea is that you use these uh, hooks not because you are really interested in the data right in what block number yeah. 
this, but mostly because uh, you can drive updates on other components. Right? So for example, in, in this example, I use the block number and not really, again, interested in the value of the block number, just interested that every time the block number changes, so there is a new block, I want to fetch some external data. So I always show fresh data to my users. I think that's, that's this pattern is used a lot in, in the next components we are going to see. So another component and that's not very interesting, to be honest, uh, is this use contract uh, uh, hook that just used to construct a, a contract uh, and you need to pass the, pass the ABI and the address of the contract, right? Um, I think it's important for this use case to have a hook because uh, when, when you deploy a production application, you always have two networks, one for the test network, and then you have a version for the production network, right? And so as the user changes the, the network they're connected to, we also need to refresh basically the contracts because the address changes. And, and so this hook is very, uh, you know, it's very convenient to do that. And so finally, we get to the juicy hoops, the one that are actually exciting and useful. And so the first one is you start start net code. And the idea is that, as the name implies, is that we are fetching data you know, from, from the smart contract and we are calling like a view function. So a read, read only function. Uh, this hook as arguments basically accept the, the contract that we constructed previously with the use contract hook, then the, a method name and the arguments to this method. And we return some values. One is the, if we return basically the result of the call to the contract, if it has a flag that basically saying, are we calling the contract or we already called the contract, which is the loading flag, or basically a flag basically that has the error value. And then finally, we have a method that if you want to refresh the data, because maybe the user disconnected from the network, now they want to refresh the data, we should provide them a button to do that. And so there's a callback to do that. And here, that's how you use it. So here we create our contract using a hook and it's good practice, at least in my experience, to create hooks to instantiate your contracts, right, specific to your application. So in this case, I have a hook that, you know, just to instantiate this counter contract, which is an example. And then I call my hook with the contract as parameter. The method is basically to get the current value of the counter. And then I pass an uh, empty, uh, arguments, right? Because this function doesn't take any argument. And we see I'm interested only in the results for this example. I don't care about showing like a load or anything. And then uh, I add an, an extra uh, hook at the bottom, right? Where I extract the value from, from this result and convert it to, to a string value in base 10. Again, because that's what the users want to see. And see, I think the exciting thing about this use starting a call is that it will make a call to your contract only if the contract, the method name, and the arguments are not undefined. And why I say it's exciting? Because most of the times what we, we are doing when building applications that we need to fetch data from somewhere. Maybe it's our backend application. Maybe it's another call to another smart contract. Or maybe we are just waiting for the user to connect their wallet to display their balance. Right? And so we don't always have the value to make the call. And without hoots, it's, it's quite tricky. To, to do that, you know, we will need to have a lot of logic and you know, keep track of state is basically very complex. And with these hoots, they make it very easy. So in that case, if you don't have arguments, we just pass you know, like undefined to the arguments. And then when, for example, the user connects the wallet, we finally get the value of the user account and we can uh, make the call. Also another cool thing is that uh, you start on a call supports type parameters. So if I know the, the type, and the number of parameters my function requires, I can pass it in to use start and echo. And that way, if I pass the wrong number of arguments in the, to the code, the, basically the TypeScript code will not compile. So there's no risk of deploying code that has actually a bug. I think so it's good practice to do that. And now similar to startnet uh, call, there's startnet invoke, uh, which basically does call external functions on our smart contract. I noticed that unlike starting a code, this uh, hook only requires to pass the contract and the method name, okay? And we return a lot of values. It will return basically the data, which contains the transaction hash that because basically becomes uh, non-undefined only after the user invokes the function. Then we have a, basically a flag to know if the user is actually invoking the function. And finally, we have this invoke uh, 
function, right? Which is used to import the external method on the contract. And that's how we use it, right? In this case, uh, we can do the same thing we did for the code. And we can pass as type parameter, the number and type of arguments that our function takes. So in this case, we, we, we force the compiler to only accept calls where I only pass one argument and it's a string. And then here I can show, I show that basically, you know, if you have some data, so if the data or if the value of data is not undefined, it means that users submit a transaction and we have a hash for it. Then in other cases, we want to show, for example, some type of spinner where the user is, you know, is waiting to, to accept the, the transaction from R's and text. And then if there's any error when submitting a transaction, we want to show that to the user. Again, I think it's very important to have these small things to make user experience uh, good. And I think these suits can really make it very fast to, to develop nice applications. And finally, we, we see basically the action we can do. And we, have, uh, we can see how the, our code can easily invoke an external method on the smart contract. And again, here we see that I pass one argument and it's a string, so the code will compile. If I pass something else, then the code is not going to compile. And again, I think it's very important to, to make sure we don't deploy applications that have bugs. And now, if you develop any type of decentralized apps, you know that, again, to improve user experience, it's a good practice to show a list of transactions and their status, right? So the users always know, you know what the, you know, all the interaction with the chain, because there's some latency between when they submit the transaction and when they get the value back. And so it's important to, to make them understand what they're doing. And so we provide uh, this transaction manager that we use using a hook and it, you know, and it returns a list of transactions. And we also return some function that can be used to add a transaction, which is a bit a low level operation that you probably not, it's not important for now. Then we have a hook that basically remove, remove, we have a function that removes the transaction from the list of tracked transactions. So the transaction manager will forget about it. And then we have another uh, function that helps basically refresh the, the transaction state immediately. And the uh, cool thing about this transaction manager is that behind the scene, it will keep updating the transaction status without you having to write any code. Right? And so after the user submitted a transaction, it will refresh the transaction status quite often, I think every two, three, five seconds, because we expect it to change very quickly. After the transaction has been received by the gateway, so the uh, starting node, we know that it will take you know, probably five to 10 seconds to, to accept. So we pull for the, for the transaction state less often. And after it's been accepted on, on L2, we don't really care about that much. And uh, we also know it will take a long time before it is accepted by L1. And so we refresh the transaction status every 30 seconds to one minute. And so that way you don't have to worry about, you know, about keeping track of all these transactions and you know, when to refresh them, the library does it for you. And so it becomes very easy, actually trivial to just have a pop-up menu, for example, where we show the transactions that the user submitted with their status and you know, even we can provide a, a link to Voyager. And so that was all, and you can find the, the source code online on GitHub and you know, uh, contribute Contributors are welcome, and uh, you can contact me on on Twitter or on Discord if you want to contribute, and you know I can help you get started. And I think that's all. Fantastic, thank you. Up, oh, fantastic, thank you, um, thank you uh, for your presentation. I have a question for you actually yes. before we take a questions from people. So if you have uh, questions, you can ask them on Discord in the community channel uh, section. I have a question for you. So your components are making very regular calls to refresh data from StarkNet. Yeah. Um, but what's funny to me is that right now, StarkNet is fully centralized around us and we operate the prover, the sequencer and the node. Like there's mm -hmm. just a bunch of nodes that we operate. And this is a, a big stress on, our, on, on the architecture. So I find it really funny to that at the same time, you know, a few community calls back who are saying, yeah, so we have performance issue. We're trying to solve this. And right now we're saying like, yeah, so just pull it every second and eventually <laughs> the value will update. <laughs> I uh, think this is this is really funny. But um, it's also a good, uh, it, it's, it's interesting to see practices uh, around uh, that. I was wondering if you had a, I don't know, 
feedback or is it something you take in, in account uh, currently when you're developing a, a new X on, on Starknet or not really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a good point. Uh, also, for example, my experience building apps on uh, DVM, so using Atom for API, right? In my experience actually, yes, we are polling every often, but in reality, most users will use your app for maybe five minutes to one, you know, to 10 minutes if it's really an engaging app. And so it's not actually that many calls, right? They make two or three transactions and they get accepted. So they make maybe 50 calls, right? And even the basic plan on Atom is 10,000 calls. So, uh, uh, my, I, I my, think it makes sense. I also think that uh, it makes sense for you not to structure your app around temporary limitations that we have on our side. Because, uh, I mean, you know, if you don't stress the architecture, then yep. we're in no rush to improve it. And <laughs> since you stress it, we make something better and, you know, full nodes will come mm -hmm. eventually. Uh, so we have... Yeah, so I think actually related to that, I think uh, I'm not worried about uh, the node, right? Because again, yeah, eventually there will be more service provided for it. It's just a matter of user experience, right? If you make too many calls too frequently, then it's annoying for the user, right? The, the, you use their bandwidth and also the browser can be, be slowed down. And so I think it's important to set a good value for, you know, just to, so the users have data that is fresh enough, but so it doesn't stress their, their browser too much. Interesting, thank you. So it's both in order to so it's both in order to not to let Starknet engineers sleep at night, but also to <laughs> to have a better UX. Interesting. Yeah. So we have two two questions. Uh, one related to Node, which we'll cover a bit later. So uh, Jan M has a question for you. Is there a good example of an application that is open source? built on this, would love to check it out. Thanks. So I think you pointed to your GitHub repo, but uh, I don't uh, know if yeah. you have other feedback. So, yeah, so the good thing is that uh, in the repo, in the readme, I have like a list of applications that are using uh, Starknet React and the one uh, Bitmap Box is not open source yet. But there's another game that I think it is open source and hope so. And anyway, right, uh, I think the examples are in reality are good enough, right? Uh, I try to make them as close as possible to what I'm using in a real application. And also these hooks come from my experience in building Bitmap bots and previously building on uh, the EVM. And so I don't think that that answered the question, but what I say is that the example is realistic enough. Okay, thank you, perfect. Um, people in the audience, I don't know if you have um, other oh. questions, please don't hesitate and ask them. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, I think we're, we're good. Thank you again for your, uh, for inter your, uh, your intervention, your, um, presentation. Um, it's really cool because we had a bunch of people uh, presenting, uh, backend stuff for smart contracts and things like that. And it's really good to have uh, people working on the front end, uh, mm -hmm. too. Yeah. And, uh, I agree with you. We should, uh, ship apps without bugs <laughs> and, uh, and um, yes, front. We don't often think of front-end bugs as you know a vector for malfunction for smart contract, but they're they actually kind of is, especially you know for more solidified networks like Ethereum, where you know for applications like Aave, Uniswap, I think most of the interaction with the apps are actually from other contracts. So front-end are important but not as important as for nascent networks, such as Starknet where, mm -hmm. or games, where most of the user interaction will come from, um, from front ends. Yeah. Cool. So, okay, uh, if there are no other questions, um, thank you again. And uh, we can give the floor to Ariel, who joined us on the call. Ariel, um, can you hear us? Hey, yes, I can hear you. Can you, everybody can you can... hear me? I'm sorry? Uh, should I unmute myself on Discord? Yes, also, please, you should uh, request to speak on Discord. Okay, let's figure out how to do that. Feed the Fed. Okay, this should be working now. Okay, it now is. it's working. Okay. Okay, great. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, what's new in uh, 0.8 and uh, then feel free to ask uh, questions. 
Okay, so let me start by the minor, the less, uh, the smaller news. There are a lot of small Cairo improvements. So there's a now the new operator. There's a, the, another hash function is added to the uh, implementations. Uh, I, my recommendation here is for you to check out the, uh, these called announcements and check out the, all the bunch of little Cairo tweaks. Uh, the best way to uh, get familiar with the changes is to actually play with them. Uh, I'll focus now on the big things and discuss uh, fees and the bunch of stuff we added to the capabilities of the CLI. So obviously the big, the big thing in uh, 0.8 is uh, transaction fees, um, which are now uh, not yet enforced, but payable and will be enforced in the next version, 0.9. So right now, the, the big change is that you can now attach a, a new field to your transaction, max fee, which is signed by the user. And uh, this fee can be uh, charged in, according to the resources required by the transaction. So if I share my screen for a minute here. Can I ask you a question, question here, here uh, Ariel? Ariel? Sorry. No, uh, what should I close to avoid this echo? Mm -hmm. The Discord. You can, you can probably, probably, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's good. now I'm muted. Yeah, so you can uh, you can um, basically unmute when you want to, to speak. Um, so my okay. question is uh, the following. Uh, first, just want to make it clear for everyone. So uh, the fees are activated, but not enforced means and stop me if i'm wrong that it's technically possible to pay fees if you want to but you don't have to pay fees and then in version 0 0.9 you'll be forced to pay fees now the question is why would you want to pay fees if you don't have to uh, and the, the the answer is well you'll have to pay fees eventually so you want to be able to integrate this in your app right now to make sure that it's working correctly. So that's why we're facing it in this way. So I just wanted to clear that thing. And when you're saying you can add a, a fee field to your transaction, what, what do you mean by that? Like, is it when you're calling your account contract or is it to the transaction object? Where, where do you specify that exactly? Okay, so... You need to reactivate on Discord. I activated it, right? Do I need to do anything else? No, it, it's okay, it's okay. Okay, so, uh, sorry about that. Okay, so as a user or developer, uh, what, I, uh, what I need to do is to wait for the SDKs to update their versions to uh, be compatible with 0.8. For example, if I'm just a user and I want to interact with the Argent X wallet, so uh, I need ArgentX wallet to be able to support me signing a fee. So I'm pretty sure that they released already. If not, they'll release, uh, release it uh, in the very near future, um, a new version for the, uh, for the wallet, which in addition to the transaction parameters allows me uh, to sign a max fee for the transaction. And uh, this max fee or uh, something lower than it will be charged uh, in fake ETH tokens in uh, Starknet testnet. Uh, by, by fake ETH, I mean just testnet ETH. So, so uh, I think uh, Arjun released, released the new the wallet. wallet. I'm not sure if the UX, I haven't tried the UX yet, but the new wallets are out, so uh, they should be usable. Yeah. So not really sure uh, about this uh, echo thing. Uh, yeah, the flow the between flow Zoom and Zoom Discord and YouTube and is not optimal, but that's what we have for now. Um, okay, so in rough, in rough terms, the fee is documented in our uh, technical uh, documentation on the website. So currently, the only thing that is charged is the computation. So the transaction, the source of the cost of a transaction is basically twofold. You have the computational element and you have the L1 footprint because uh, every storage update or messages sent to, uh, uh, to L1 
uh, are eventually uh, sent as data on chain, which uh, bears some cost. So in this version, we're ignoring the L1 footprint, uh, we, which will be actually incorporated in the next version, but right now we're focusing on computation. And inside computation, there are a few things uh, we, can, uh, we can focus. So basically the reason I'm sharing my screen here is for you guys uh, to see uh, this particular part. Um, so when you're executing a StarkNet transaction, uh, if you uh, look at the API, for example, this is uh, a new endpoint of the API, which I want to talk about. But if you look at the answer you're getting back from StarkNet, you'll see uh, the resources required by the transaction. So uh, you have the number of steps and the number of applications uh, of each building. Now, without going uh, too deeply into each element, I'll just say that each of them has another, uh, has a different computational cost. Uh, so for example, every uh, Cairo step has a cost uh, which is uh, 0 0.05 uh, gas per step. So this is the cost, the gas cost of a single uh, Cairo step. And the actual fee associated with the transaction uh, follows from uh, the gas, from the current gas price. Um, so in order to know what fee is associated with your transaction, uh, we have an, a new capability in the CLI for estimating the fee which we'll document in the next minor version, hopefully in a week or so. Uh, but when you call this fee estimator, which I assume uh, if not already, then it will be integrated with the wallet. But once you get the fee estimate, you know what fee should be associated uh, with your transaction. And right now this fee, uh, fee estimate only takes into account built-in applications with those particular costs. So each built-in, has an associated gas per application with it and some gas that, it's char that is charged uh, per Cairo step. You can read this documentation more carefully in order to uh, get a sense of why those numbers, why is this not double, why is this not halved? Uh, I don't want to get into it right now because it will take too much of our time, but uh, if you want an intuition of where are those numbers coming from, uh, I invite you to read the rest of this documentation and follow up uh, on this call. Uh, but this should allow you to uh, compute for yourself the fee estimate. Um, and obviously, uh, the flow from the user perspective is just to call a certain endpoint to in order to estimate the fee. And uh, this will be documented in the next minor release. So the flow from the user's endpoint is estimate my fee either manually by calling the endpoint myself or through the wallet, and then uh, signing a certain fee uh, on my transaction. So that's what I have to say about fees in uh, 0.8. Um, we, have a, yeah, we have a question. Have a question. Marcelo, Marcelo is saying, is saying okay, okay, now, now that now we have a, a limit, um, how far can we go with each transaction? And specifically it says, does the introduction of fees also increase the max amount of steps? So can you talk a bit about how you forecast, you know, basically one of the reasons we had to have a relatively low limit in the number of steps is that since everything was free and it was easy to abuse, now that it's less easy to abuse, how do you, what's the plan with regard to that limit when do we want to raise it why according to which criteria? and uh, i'm guessing we're not going to raise erase that limit until uh, you know fees are enforced but um yeah can you talk a bit about this please yes so yeah so like you said we did not yet change this limit but as fees will be enforced we can uh, gradually increase uh, gradually increase this limit because now uh, it will no longer be the case that the entire burden uh, of the proof is uh, basically subsidized by Starkware as everything will, uh, will come from the user paying their own fees. There will still obviously be a limitation uh, per block, which depends on uh, what uh, latency we want to achieve, how, uh, how long do we want to wait for the proof uh, to, to be included in L1, uh, that sort of considerations. 
but uh, but you are right in the in the sense that right now a limiting factor for this block uh, block steps cap is that it's completely uh, funded by us which will no longer uh, be the case but at as of this moment we still uh, we still haven't increased it as far as i know at least thank you thank I you have another, I have question. another question um, um how do, how do you, you, can you stop, stop, stop the... Thank you. Um, ah, okay, I managed to do it uh, only on the... Perfect. Uh, Perfect. So, so my, my question, question, my question my is, um, how so right now the price of gas is fixed. How is it fixed? What what is uh, What are the components that are, that will influence the price of gas? And, and specifically, my question is like, on Ethereum, instinctively, you know, there is more transactions, so the price of gas rises in order to sort transactions in between. Um, how does that work in StarkNet, where, in a way, the more transaction, the lower the cost per transaction for a proof? And how do you, how do you, and, and also the, the price of the gas should take, in some to some extent, in in consideration the price of gas on L1, which may change very rapidly when you want to put the proof on, on, on L1. And uh, I was wondering if we have uh, ideas around um, how gas price will evolve according, according to which criteria. Okay, so uh, let me start by, uh, by, uh, by making myself clear that the units uh, in every fee component, which I've shown previously, uh, is Ethereum gas. So a Cairo step is uh, 500 of a uh, single uh, unit of Ethereum gas. And the fee associated with the transaction will be, of course, dependent on the current Ethereum gas price. Uh, the reason uh, behind this coupling to the Ethereum gas prices is that eventually uh, we're uh, considering the, the costs of, ver of verifying a proof on Ethereum. So Imagine very roughly that if I can include in Ethereum a proof of uh, 200 million Cairo steps and the cost of verifying this proof on Ethereum is 5 million, then this is exactly where the 500 number is coming from. So uh, I can think of a single Cairo step as costing me uh, this much guess uh, roughly. So that's how we're pricing each computational uh, component in terms of Ethereum gas. Uh, an important comment uh, it, in this, uh, for this version is that the gas prices associated with the fees will be fixed until uh, the next minor release where we will, where we will actually uh, use um, Web3 uh, gas price uh, estimates. But for now, it's fixed at, uh, I think, 100 uh, GUI. Uh, this will change in uh, 081. But uh, this is the situation at the moment. And then we'll uh, move to use uh, dynamic uh, gas prices. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Feel free to direct me more. It, it does. It thank does. you. Thank you. Um, um, we have another have question another... from uh, Francesco, actually. Um, in a post by Lior, he mentions that state differences will be accounted for in the fees. Um, is it something we implemented uh, or will? And uh, do you have an update or some thoughts on that? Will in the next uh, major release in 0.9. Right now, we neglected uh, the L1 footprint. We neglected everything that is on chain data, uh, including storage updates. Now it is only computation cost. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, Marcelo is asking, taking in consideration that accounts in StarkNet are, are abstract, abstract, is it, is possible, it possible for an app to, to subsidize fees for its users? Um, I think I can answer this one. I'd say yes, absolutely. Um, um, so, so correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, wrong. Ariel, right? But when you send a transaction, the entry point will be an account contract and the fees will be paid by that account. So. If your user wants to do a transaction, what you can do as a, as a DApp developer or a, somebody doing exactly what you want to do, the user can sign his transaction exactly the same way, the same payload that he would send directly to StarkNet. But instead of doing that, 
you send it as the payload of your transaction to your account contract and you pay fees at that point. So that's one possibility to do it, I'd say. Um, and then, um, I mean, you know, account contracts are a fairly open stack. You can write your own smart contract and your own account contract. So you can probably also write um, account contracts where the transaction goes directly to the user wallet and fees are paid uh, differently somehow there. But maybe you can talk a bit about that, Aria. Like, um, so when the fees are taken from the account, how, how does that happen exactly? Is it, uh, where, uh, where does that happen? How, how is it enforced? And um, can the account contract make a call to another contract to pay for fees? Or how, what's the limit to what you can do in an account contract? Okay, so um, this is shortly uh, referencing the technical documentation for the fees I show, I've shown before. Uh, the idea is, uh, is as follows. Right now, uh, every account contract has to have a certain structure. For, it is not completely arbitrary. It does have to contain an execute method. All, uh, all interactions with your account contract has to go through this particular entry point. And the Starknet OS, which is the Cairo program behind Starknet, uh, you can think of it as Starknet's engine, will inject a call, another call at the end of this execute function from the account contract, uh, which will transfer the fee that you signed on, or at most this fee, uh, to the sequencer's uh, balance on L2. So basically what happens is you signed a certain max fee, you called the execute method, which also verified the signature. And then if all the execution was valid, let's say the sequencer estimated, uh, estimated your transaction fee to be half of the max fee you actually signed. Uh, then what, uh, what it will be able to do is, in, an in, is inject a call uh, to a sort of a transfer method in the end of this function that will give half of the max fee you signed on uh, to himself, to, uh, to, the, to his own uh, address. Uh, there are no limitations here. He can transfer to himself any amount between zero and the max fee uh, that the user uh, uh, signed, which obviously serves as an upper bound on the fee. So that's that's the way it roughly uh, works. Thank you. Understood. So it also does mean that currently one can still send garbage transactions that are invalid, and they will be executed by uh, the sequencer. So it's still a DOS vector, right? We, I mean. Having the fee and having red green fee are two different. Uh, the word in French is chantier, but I would say like two are two different um, things we're working on, right? Um, I was wondering if you have an update or if you could talk a bit about uh, red fee, green fee, or the the, the approach, the approach we, have here. we have here. Yes, so I don't have any news regarding to the uh, long term DOS prevention plan. Uh, but this is unrelated to, uh, to the current change. Uh, right now, the sequencer is only able to charge fees uh, for successful executions. Um, there is no uh, fee associated with, uh, with an unsuccessful execution. Um, maybe just in two words, as the account abstraction uh, evolves, and you can see the full plan on the uh, on the Starknet uh, Shaman's uh, discourse, uh, discourse platform, uh, it will have a lit even slightly more structure. Right now we have the execute function, which is a mandatory entry point for an account contract. In the future, there will also be a validate, uh, a validate method uh, where the flow of every transaction would be to first path through uh, validate which can do whatever the account contract wants. It can verify a single signature. It can verify a multi-sig. It can do some weird logic. And only then, if verification was successful, then uh, uh, the running is transferred to, to the execute entry point. Um, so what will be possible is to charge fees 
for transactions where validate was successful, but execute wasn't. Because this means that this is indeed a transaction that was signed, signed in a generalized sense or approved, I should say, by the user, uh, but was unsuccessful for every reason. So this means that the sequencer did try to do some effort. He at least verified uh, that this transaction was indeed approved. So in this case, we might want to allow him to charge some fee, probably not all the fee, but maybe a small portion of it. But uh, that's the future, let's say, of a, pos a possible future uh, of account contracts. Right thank now, you, we can you. charge any number between zero and the max fee and only upon successful execution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what about, I'm just checking, yeah. What about um, limiting function stent to StarkNet to account contract? Is this enforced yet or is it still possible to send a transaction to any smart contract? And the second question is, um, how does StarkNet OS differentiates between account contracts and regular contracts that are valid entry points? Okay, so today uh, you can still interact directly with contracts, uh, with the smart contracts, which are not accounts. Uh, this will no longer be possible in uh, 0.9. You your transaction will have to go to an account contract and pay a fee. Uh, and how will StarkNet uh, differentiate? Actually, it's pretty easy. Any contract with a few given entry points, in this case, only execute, can be considered uh, an account contract. So if your contract has an execute function and uh, enough ETH in his balance, uh, enough L2, uh, ETH on L2, uh, then uh, it can serve an, as an account contract and uh, the transaction may go through it because after running execute, the sequencer will be able to transfer funds from the executor to himself. Thank you. Thank you. Marcelo is asking, if at some point the sequencer will be elected, is it possible for such a sequencer to accept other tokens as fees? In other words, can we pay in other tokens than just ETH? Or do we plan to allow this? So yeah, it's complicated with the whole Discord Zoom thing. Um, so yes, we do plan to allow it. Uh, this is actually the post, our post on account abstraction is divided into two parts. So look for account abstraction part two. Uh, that's where we talk about uh, fee abstraction and uh, introducing paymasters and uh, the ability to pay in uh, different tokens. Uh, in the near future, it won't be possible. In the near future, the fee token will be fixed uh, at ETH. Um, but we do plan to uh, have a fee abstraction in StarkNet. Perfect. Thank you. Account abstraction, fee abstraction. And now with Warp, we have Cairo abstraction. Interesting. <laughs> um, so Marcelo is also asking, so we were talking about, you know, um, basically validate and execute and the evolution of account abstraction. The question here is, um, does that mean that users will pay for reverted to transactions? Um, yeah, I think that here the question is specifically around how do we charge for users when their transactions are not executable um, and uh, what we see as uh, something that may arise here. So one possible solution is the red gain fee that you mentioned, uh, which means the, the, roughly the idea is for user to sign two different types of fees. One is the red fee and the other is the green fee, which is higher. Uh, and upon a successful validation, but unsuccessful execution, the sequencer would be allowed to charge the red fee because this, uh, because successfully running validate uh, can be taken as indication that the sequencer indeed honestly attempted to execute your transaction uh, and failed. Uh, this solution can obviously be improved because there are a certain way to uh, attack this. Let's say that the sequencer is malicious and only ever takes the, uh, the red fees 
he never att attempts execution, then perhaps the user might want to blacklist certain sequencers. There are ways to walk around it, but uh, the highlight of the idea is to have two type of fees, one for successful execution and the other for successful validation. Thank you. Um, a user, so it's not directly related with uh, what we were um, discussing, and it's a question I don't have an answer to, but um, a user was asking, hey, how do I know if my node, uh, my StarkNet node is syncing correctly? How do I monitor that? Um, I haven't used PyFinder yet. I was wondering if you had or if you have any insights uh, into that. Um, but I guess, like if I had to guess, uh, probably there's a command to tell you what is the last block number on your node. Probably you can check what's the latest block number and check on the Voyager or something else and you can see if the node is synced. But um, yeah, I don't know, Ariel, if you have uh, other insights on how do I know that my node is running correctly? Um, okay, so I haven't run the node myself, but we do have a Discord channel with the Pathfinder folk who can definitely answer this more expertly that, than I can. But the node does serve a JSON RPC. Uh, in particular, you can get the current block number. You can get the last block that was seen on L1, the last block that was seen on L2. Um, so basically, yeah, when you're, when you're running the node, uh, you're, you basically know that you're doing the right things to verify, uh, to verify the, the current uh, state of StarNet because you're doing, you're running the actual code. So I'm not sure that answers the, your question, but uh, um, I think it's fine. Cool. Thank uh, you. Um, okay, so I know you have to run. So thank you. One last question. Your name is Feed the Fed on uh, on Discord. Can you talk a bit about inflation and how you see this coming from? No, I'm, I'm kidding you. I know you're in a hurry and you can't think for too much. This will be a discussion for another time. <laughs> for this discussion, I can always stay. I was <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you, Ariel, for taking time with us today. Um, I'll be here for a few more minutes if you have a... Um, follow-up question. So, so Nico, thank you, Nico, I will uh, drop. So thank you, Ariel. Bye. Bye. So Nico is asking, I hope that's not a stupid question. It never is. Don't worry about it. When it comes to fee abstraction, how does it work in the background? Does, for example, if you pay with DAI, the DAI just get converted to into ETH instantly? And if yes, how will, be will this be swapped? Will a custom AMM be built for this? Or how will an AMM be chosen? And everything. So um, I posted in Discord right above your question two topics uh, that were created by a Starkware uh, member about Starknet, like the account abstraction model we're uh, imagining for um, for Starknet. So uh, I invite you to um, take a look there because this is where we share our IDs. All of this is still being worked out. It's not fixed. We don't have a fixed design for everything. We're very much building this as um, as we go. And as you guys give us um, your feedback, um, your feedback is read and used, and we very much take it into account. So don't hesitate and engage in these posts in Shamans. There's no stupid question and no stupid uh, answers to these questions but specifically for your question i don't know if it makes sense necessarily to you know convert the die to eth uh, maybe it makes sense to for each sequencer to specify which token they can they can they accept to pay uh, for the fees so maybe they will want to re receive it directly maybe they'll want to convert it so i think there's a lot of way you can design around that um and you know um, Marcelo was saying, hey, does that mean that uh, as a company, I can pay for the fees for my user? There's probably, you can also probably implement wallet where, you know, fees abstraction is abstracted. So you can uh, basically, even if the sequencer accepts only ETH, you can change um, is die on the fly with another kind of account contract to pay in ETH. You can imagine a lot of things with that. So um, I think, I'm, I'm not sure uh, if it makes sense to implement this at the core or um, or just let the uh, sequencer uh, choose what they want to receive. But that's just what I think, right? Uh, your opinion, I'd be curious to have your opinions. So do 
share it on shamans. By the way, talking about shamans, um, so I wanted to talk about this very briefly. Um, we currently, our community seems to synchronize around two tools, which is Discord and uh, shamans, so discourse. And to a, l a large extent also Twitter, but that doesn't count, it's different. Uh, because Discord and uh, Discourse are really like StarkNet focused tools. Um, I think one of the thing we need to figure out as a community is how do we fix knowledge somewhere that is indexable and where Google can, can be used to index the content and search for it later on. Um, if you're in uh, the StarkNet channel, you probably have seen the same questions come over and over again, and then we have to uh, I mean, we have, I say we as a community, because most of the time it's not us answering, it's you guys, like answering the same questions. Um, and, and there's no easy solution to that. Setting up Stack Overflow is not accessible right now. Uh, we don't have a, a big enough community for that. And so we deployed this discourse instance, Shamans, to both have high-level discussions. And right now we have them there. It's really, we have a really a high quality discussions there and that's really cool um, I think it's also a platform we could use for support I know open Zeppelin uses it a lot you know people post questions and then they get answers and everything so I think my my question for you or my remark is like I think we can use this tool better as a community to answer the questions of people there and to redirect newcomers to ask their question there so that we can um so that we can, you know, point them there with a link rather than just answering the same thing over and over again. So anyway, if you have an insight uh, in that or if you're, uh, if that's a question you think is uh, worth digging, I'm happy to talk and, and, and to discuss. Um, yeah, so I'm going to check if there will be other, if there are other questions. I don't seem to see these in YouTube. I don't see other questions in Discord. So. I think if we're done, that's a wrap. Um, so Francesco is saying, here's a list of projects using the library. Yep, yeah, so uh, Francesco just posted some new, um, some uh, links towards the library he was uh, talking on. Um, so don't hesitate to click there. Um, okay, so if there are no other questions, um, I'll be, I'm, Thank you for uh, for attending. Always happy to see uh, people turn out here. It's really interesting because, you know, we've done some calls that were just on YouTube and they never have as much attendees as there is on Discord. Um, but a lot of time people share their screen in YouTube and you can't see them on Discord. So I'm, I'm, I'm really curious why that is the case. Um, but yeah, I think for now, even though it's not very convenient, we'll start We'll, we'll still uh, stick to Discord and uh, YouTube. So yeah, that's for the community call organization. Um, and also, if you want to present your project or come show something cool um, around uh, what you're building on StarkNet, there's a post on Shamans with the upcoming date for the calls. So don't hesitate and say, hey, can I present that date? Uh, always welcome and we're happy to showcase your project. Um, and also I wanted to mention that uh, we are currently um, trying to extend our education effort on StarkNet and to get more people on board it. So, um, and to explain to more devs how StarkNet works and how they can deploy smart contract. If it's something you'd like to be involved in, um, do reach out. Happy to brainstorm on how we can make things better. Um, and I also wanted to mention that uh, we are currently running a program for meetups. So if you want to organize a meetup in your city, there's a lot of ways, different ways it can happen. The best configuration is if you can organize it, we're happy to help pay for the venue, for drinks, for pizza, whatever. Um, and the ideal way for this to happen is you present StarkNet, even you may present what you're building on. I mean, you organize a meetup as you want and we can make time to be available for an AMA um, and to discuss with, uh, to, to answer questions remotely. Um, yeah, and if uh, your event is uh, somewhere close to where we are, which is Europe, 
or Colorado or Israel. Uh, or who knows, we may show up and, uh, and do the IMA in, in person. I, for sure, if it's in Europe, uh, would be happy to come. So don't hesitate and organize these events. Do let us know how we can help you. All right. So I think that's a wrap. Thank you again for your attention. And uh, I'll see you next time. Next call is in uh, two weeks on Tuesday, 29th of April. All right. So I hope everyone has a good day. Until next time.